Hello and welcome aboard. My name is Mike Bannister. I'm the Chief Concorde Pilot at British Airways. This is the flight deck of Concorde, the world's only supersonic airliner, the most advanced aircraft in the world, the only way that you and I can fly at twice the speed of sound. Come with me in this program. We're going to show you some marvellous shots, some unique footage. We're going to show you some of the things that Concorde has done throughout the years and tell you about her future. This is going to be a metaphorical flight that will take you to the edge of space, where the sky gets darker, where you can see the curvature of the Earth. It's going to be the ride of a lifetime. Join me today, and hopefully join me aboard one time in the future. Few aircraft in the world still turn heads as much as Concorde. With her unique mix of technical innovation and evocative, even sensual design, Concorde remains a paradox in today's world of civil aviation. Still capable of outperforming any other civil or military aircraft, Concorde remains undisputedly the world's greatest airliner. So here we are, standing in front of one of the British Airways 7 Concords, this one GBOAC. Our Concords are listed from AA through to AG, or Alpha Alpha to Alpha Golf. And GBOAC, or Alpha Charlie as we call her, is, if you like, the flagship of the flagships because she's got the letters of our forerunner airline BOAC. And I'm standing right next to a spare Olympus 593 engine, a Rolls-Royce Snecma engine. And this is one of the three key technical things about this wonderful aeroplane. There's many people that make her fly and many wonderful technical aspects, but three key things that I'd just like to take you through as we prepare for that flight to New York. This is one of them, the Olympus engine used on many other different things around the world, but this particular version has reheat or afterburner, and we use that for takeoff and acceleration through the sound barrier to take Concorde supersonic. At takeoff, it has 38,000 pounds of thrust, about the same as 6,000 family cars, and can accelerate us from a standstill to 250 miles an hour in around 40 seconds, or, when we're at lightweight, even faster than a Formula One race car. That's the airplane, that's the engine that enables us to get up and away, set off faster even than a subsonic jet on our way towards the point where we start accelerating to supersonic speeds. So right here, just behind Concorde's main wheels, are the engine intakes. That little engine sits behind this enormous intake. There's a pair of engines behind this intake pack here. And these are very special, because as we travel along at twice the speed of sound, 1,350 miles an hour, we've got to slow the air down to a mere 500 miles an hour in just 11 feet. That's the speed that the engines can accept that air. And to do that, we move these panels that are marked a danger up above us up and down to create shock waves inside the intake and slow the air down. And the positioning of those panels is absolutely crucial. It's accomplished by computers designed by a British company way back in the 60s. And the computers that were devised to do that were a real breakthrough in aviation. If there's one thing that made Concorde successful, where the American and the Russian versions weren't, it was the computer that positions those intakes, enables us to fly supersonically for up to three hours at a stretch. And the third and final really important element is the wing, the very special features on the wing that keep our center of gravity in just the right place. 
Apart from the ability to store fuel, Concorde's wing is totally different from a conventional airplane, and so are the flying controls. An ordinary aircraft has ailerons, a rudder and elevators. Concorde has a rudder, but the ailerons and the elevator are combined into what we call an elevon to give pitch and roll control. They're right at the back of the wing. They're drooped down right now because there's no power on the airplane. But when she's powered up, they're smooth, flush, and in total alignment, streamlining Concorde for high-speed flight. Also, the wing gives us some very interesting shapes, not only for supersonic flight and for the aerodynamics we need, but also to give us the ability to control the balance of Concorde. To keep her in trim, we pump fuel from a tank right at the front of the airplane to a tank right at the back to balance the movement of lift as we go faster and faster. But the very clever shape of the wing stops that lift moving too much. Without it, we wouldn't be able to balance Concorde and keep her in trim, and we wouldn't be able to fly supersonically. So those are the three things that are really important technically. The three things that enable her to fly day in and day out to New York, just like she's going to do right now. Here she comes now, right on time, and Captain Chris Norris and the rest of the crew are completing the checks before takeoff. As she taxes into place the final before takeoff checks and talking to London Air Traffic Control, getting clearance for departure. Any moment now, he's going to open up the four Rolls Royce Olympus engines to full power, and the reheats will cut in. Three, two, one, now! Here she comes, you can hear the roar increasing as she accelerates to 150 miles an hour. Two hundred and fifty and she rotates and lift off. to New York. She'll be there in just over three hours. Shortly after takeoff, whilst climbing at a rate of 2,000 feet per minute, the crew undertake the noise abatement procedure. Three, two, one, noise. This involves cutting the power by 15% and switching off the engine reheats, helping to reduce the noise for those living underneath the flight path. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Captain Chris Norris, uh, cruising along now, 26,000 feet and just under the speed of sound. We're estimating arrival in New York, touching down around 10 minutes past 9, just over 3 hours from now, the time in New York, 5 past 6. Once clear of the coastline, Captain Chris Norris engages full power once more, whilst the flight engineer applies the reheats in pairs. Firstly, the inborne pair on engines 2 and 3, followed by the outboard pair on engines one and four. At this point, the passengers will have noticed two slight nudges in the back of their seats as the extra raw power kicks in, helping Concord accelerate towards the sound barrier at Mark one. As the aircraft passes the speed of sound, the only indication on board to identify the change of status from subsonic to supersonic comes in the form of a horizontal indicator, flickering as it picks up the shockwave off the nose as the plane passes Mark 1. The pleasure of this being a job of work that we do is that I think we all, without question, enjoy coming to work to fly this aeroplane. I'm not sure that all airline uh, crew could say that. We certainly all very much enjoy flying the aeroplane. We, um, we look upon it as um, being paid to enjoy ourselves, although don't tell uh, British Airways that.
I think that is one of the, the things about the aeroplane, that it is the only machine in the world where people can travel at this sort of speed, uh, in this sort of comfort. Uh, if you travel in a fighter aeroplane at this speed, you'll be sitting in a pressure suit, breathing through an oxygen mask, whereas our passenger sitting back there, drinking champagne, flying at more than twice the speed of other aeroplanes, nearly two and a half times the speed of other aeroplanes, considerably higher up than uh, other aeroplanes. And it is, again, unique. It's the only aeroplane capable of such performance. Until recently, we weren't quite the highest people on the planet, uh, because there was the Mir station, which had astronauts up in space. But uh, now that that is no longer there, the people on this aeroplane today are actually the people furthest above the planet. And every time we fly the aeroplane, of course, that is the case. Our position at the moment is that we're at 45 degrees north and 57 degrees west. That means that we are to the south of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia in Canada. We obviously choose a routing that keeps us over the sea because uh, that means we can stay supersonic uh, all the way to our final descent into New York. Uh, the routing that we've done to achieve that is to take off out of London and fly subsonically uh, towards the Bristol Channel and then when we get to the south of Wales we become clear of the coastline we can accelerate the aeroplane and um, climb it up. We have two set routings which take us to New York, or one that takes us to New York and one that brings us back again. There's no need to vary the tracks on a day-to-day -day basis because the winds up here are almost insignificant compared with our speed, so we always use the same routings. We fly along that routing. We have the height from 50 to 60,000 feet to ourselves, so we do what's called a cruise climb and uh, at the moment the aeroplane is actually climbing very slowly, 56,200, um, because there is nobody else up here to get in our way. So we just leave the engines on full cruise power and allow the aeroplane to gradually climb up as it gets lighter. For the seasoned transatlantic subsonic traveller, it's almost inconceivable that a mere two hours after leaving London and already the aircraft is passing Newfoundland in northeast Canada providing a sharp reminder, if one were needed, of Concorde's staggering performance. In order to avoid creating a sonic boom over land, Concorde is deliberately flown on a longer, more southerly course out to sea, passing a long, narrow sand spit called Sable Island. The restriction coming into New York is that we have to um, be subsonic before we cross the coast, but we in fact choose to do a routing that keeps us off the coast right until we get to Kennedy Airport. So we can stay supersonic right up until the point where we have to start slowing down in order to um, make our landing at Kennedy Airport. And uh, the way we slow down is whatever height we've got to uh, on the Atlantic crossing, we hold that height, bring the speed back to about one and a half times the speed of sound, and then we start descending and also continue slowing up uh, back to the realms of subsonic flight where we mix in with the other subsonic aeroplanes and become just like any other aeroplane landing at Kennedy Airport controlled by air traffic in New York. As Chris Norris's flight from London has trapped down the US coastline in preparation for landing at New York, its controllers are already in the process of handling another three Concorde flights in and out of Kennedy Airport. In fact, a combination of Air France's two Concorde flights, in addition to BA's two, result in JFK playing host to more of these extraordinary airliners than anywhere else in the world. Kennedy Airport, Air France, Concorde, 001. Air France, 002, Heavy Kennedy Tower, runway 31 left. I mean, they got them for... Speed red 1, heavy side, heading 350. Heading 350. In order to give the pilots a better view of the approaching airfield, the co-pilot lowers the nose and visor 10 miles out from JFK. As flight BA-1 from London nears the end of its journey, another Concorde flight BA-2 prepares to depart JFK for London on the opposite runway. Scuba 2 heavy after departure, fly to Canarsie, climb, sorry about the wait, when 02010 runway 31 left from the intersection, clear for takeoff. Canarsie climb, Scuba 2, clear for takeoff, 31 left. Baca 580, Kennedy Tower, Caution Wake Turbulence, Define Concord, Runway 31 left, taxi into position hold, next arrival is uh, 13 miles out. Put you on a hold, 31 left, back up 80. Scuba 2, flying at Canarsie, climb noise abatement. 
454 uh, Alpha Echo, Echo, Alpha Echo, you exit in the area to the northwest rate of service turn. It's called 1200, frequency change approved. Good Couple of parts just prior to you, runway 31 left, let land the wind 030 at 11. Frontline 31 left, American 1832. To avoid the many residential areas that surround Kennedy Airport, all aircraft, including Concord, are required to approach and depart the airport via predefined routes. On this morning, as the wind changed from a northerly to an easterly direction, Chris Norris and his crew were told to position their Concord onto the Kanazi approach, where aircraft have to undertake a spectacular right-hand sweep before rolling out onto finals at the last minute. As the aircraft touches down at some 180 miles per hour, a combination of reverse thrust on the four Rolls-Royce Olympus engines and powerful brakes brings the Concorde to a mere walking pace in a matter of 30 seconds. Concorde, one heavy turn left this taxi, taxi into your ramp, monitor the ground, 121.9, good morning. Okay, left here into the ramp, 121, bye-bye. A mere three hours and 13 minutes from London, and today's passengers already have the Big Apple in their sights. So much as the Big Apple is undisputedly a city of contrasts, so too can be the weather in late summer. After weeks of sunshine, a deep low pressure system brings with it a day of torrential rain. Testing conditions for one of Air France's supersonic jets, landing in bad visibility on a soaking runway after its morning flight from Paris Charleville. Thank you. 
In conditions like this, airport staff are out in force to check water levels on the web of complicated taxiways around JFK. Nine five, Grant. On Fox, across four left. I ground one here, France Concourse 002. Fox, Concourse 002. Out of the rain in the British Airways operations room in the basement of BA's terminal, crew and controllers discuss the conditions outside and what effect, if any, they might have on the day's flights. Most modern aircraft, including Concorde, are well equipped with anti-skid brakes, the surrounding damp runways posing few operational problems for today's flight crew. As the rain passes, Chris Norris and his crew head back to London, making a quick left-hand turn after takeoff to avoid noise-sensitive housing straight ahead towards Manhattan. That departure from 31 left at New York is spectacular in those conditions, but it's really very, very exciting in any condition. Perhaps the most complicated procedure that any civil aircraft flies as a departure. That's because we want to be good neighbors in New York. New York is the busiest airport for Concord, and we want to make sure that we're environmentally friendly. And to do that, just as soon as we're airborne, we turn out over Jamaica Bay, and we climb up to cross over the bridges there with our power cut back. Put a bit more power on, cross over the rockaways with the power back again before we start accelerating out towards supersonic speeds. That's not something that ordinary line pilots can do straight away, so they come here to the simulator at Bristol, the manufacturers of the airplane are based here, to learn how to fly that particular procedure. It's part of the conversion course and we do it regularly on our check routines that every pilot and flight engineer go through every six months. So here we are in the simulator, a perfect view of New York, of course, that's computer generated, but the simulator is identical to the aeroplane, and we're going to show you just the sort of things we do to be good neighbors at New York. So, get yourself strapped in. Here we are sitting on the end of the runway, maximum takeoff weight of 182 tons, a beautiful day, and we're going to set off for London. But first, the noise abatement procedure. So off come the brakes. Three, two, one, now. We open the throttles up, can slam them open. It's just a computer input. The reheat slide up, the airplane starts to accelerate. At 182 tonnes, acceleration is already better than probably your motor car. We're travelling at 75 miles an hour, starting to increase speed towards the point where we're going to check the engines are functioning correctly. That's 100 knots, power checked. So we continue to go on up towards the speed where we make a decision to commit to the takeoff. That's called V1. Here we are, coming up to that speed now, V1 and approaching the speed where we are rotate the airplane to the climb out attitude. As rotate's called, I pull back on the control column, pitching Concorde up to about 13 degrees. Shortly after that, we're airborne, positive climb, gear up, turn, roll on 25 degrees of bank. You get an excellent view out of the left-hand side of the aircraft.